so that's also kind of what's fascinating about DMT is why, you know, why is that so this perturbation, this stimulation of these 5-HT2A receptors, why does that cause this sudden transition, uh, not just to any any old kind of new model, but actually this very specific, coherent, crystalline, clear, uh, hyperdimensional reality filled with these intelligent beings. <laughs> so stoked for today's episode of the Ancient Future Podcast. I'm sitting down with Dr. Andrew Gallimore, who is a computational neurobiologist, a chemical pharmacologist, a writer. He's living and working in Tokyo, and he is the author of a range of articles and research papers on the science of psychedelic drug action, as well as two books, Alien Information Theory, Psychedelic Drug Technologies in the Cosmic Game, and the recently released Reality Switch Technologies psychedelics as tools for the discovery and exploration of new worlds. His current interests lie in the neuropharmacology and ontological implications of psychedelics and how they might be developed as tools for communication with alien intelligences that are inaccessible to normal waking consciousness. Man, I am so, so stoked for this conversation. You and I could probably riff on a million different topics. And I was watching you uh, talk the other day, another talk you did a while back, and when someone asked you to introduce yourself, you said uh, something along the lines of, I'm a neurobiologist, a psychedelic advocate, a pharmacologist, a chemist, a writer, and I really love DMT. <laughs> and uh, yeah, dude, I'm stoked because it's really not often that I get to sit down with somebody who I already am absolutely positive has the same burning passion for tryptamines and consciousness and neurochemistry and trying to understand their hidden importance in both our past and our future. So. Really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Danny. Nice to be yeah. here. Yeah, totally, man. Uh, so before we jump in fully, because we're going to jump into a lot, uh, let's talk about kind of how you landed on this path and first became interested in DMT and tryptamines. Um, well, I guess it started when I was um, uh, a teenager. Um like all teenagers, well, not like all teenagers, but like many teenagers, I was fascinated by, or I was in, I became interested in, in drugs uh, as a kind of 14, 15 year old, just as, just as the internet was, um, it really, in its very, very early stages. Um, so um, it was, it was kind of a perfect time. I just heard about this weird guy um, on the back of a magazine, an interview with this strange guy called Terence McKenna. Um, and he mentioned this molecule, this drug, his favorite drug uh, called this thing called DMT. I had no idea what DMT meant. I didn't know what it stood for. Um, so I had to go to the library and kind of look up and this kind of dictionary of a acronyms um, to find what DMT stood for. Um, even though this was, this was pre- you know, Google and uh, Erowid and things like this. So you had to do some digging. It wasn't easy to get hold of this kind of information. And then at our school, when I was maybe 15, 16 years old, we got the first internet connection. And so I would, I, I found myself, you know, any spare moment that I had, uh, I would be on the internet, on Alta Vista, you know, that original search engine back in the, in the night. Maybe you don't remember. I don't, mm. I'm maybe slightly older than you. I don't know, <laughs> um, but um, um, you know, just spending all of my spare moment every time I had free time, I would be there on on the internet, just finding out as much as I could about about um, about this strange molecule called DMT, and then that led me to Terence McKenna lectures, um, written form. You couldn't download from youtube or anything at that point uh, and it's just this this rabbit hole that i found myself tumbling down and the more that i studied it the more i learned about it the more 
fascinated and amazed. And I just knew from that point, this is it. You know, I found uh, I've always been interested in science and trying to understand things and physics and stuff like that. But this this gave me a real focus. But no, this is it. Drugs, molecules, chemistry, pharmacology. This is what I want to do. Mm. Um, and so since that that year, really, um, I've I've been totally absorbed and fascinated, thinking all the time about psychedelics, studying them. You know, I went to university, I studied chemistry and pharmacology and became known amongst my peer group as this strange little elfin guy that 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 knows a lot about drugs. Um so I got that kind of reputation and 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 that so... then that kind of um progressed into more academic interests and um you know not just the chemistry and the pharmacology but then ultimately um the, the biochemistry and, and more recently over the last decade the neuroscience as well so trying to understand what's actually going on in the brain when these molecules are ingested um and and ultimately uh, i think as we're both interested in what what do, does it all mean it's it's one thing to um to kind of have some mechanistic explanation you know what's actually going on in the brain uh, when you take something like dmt and it's a whole a whole different thing to say this is why this simple plant alkaloid has such profound effects on consciousness that's that's something that i've been writing about and thinking about and discussing with people like you and with many other people around the world uh, over the last 10 years or so um particularly it's really intensified, uh, and I think we're reaching the stage now. After twenty-five years uh, of my thinking and studying these molecules, I think we're reaching the stage now where I'm—I um, I don't have the answers, so to speak, but the the questions are coming uh, more into view. You know, what what we do understand, what we don't understand. Uh, what remains completely confounding, um, and and there are many things as we will get into that remain utterly confounding, particularly about DMT. Uh, and I always push back, as it were, against people who think that it is that we've got the answers or that we really do understand what this molecule is all about. I think we've still got a long way to go. No doubt. It's actually really like beautifully liberating to understand after a profound DMT experience that you thought you were going to get answers from that the only answer you got is we don't know shit about shit. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I've grown to appreciate the, the mysterious aspects of that. And, and no, I totally agree. And also, your story sounds very similar to mine. Like once I discovered Arrowhead as a young teenager, the website Arrowhead. And once I had my first psilocybin encounter uh, at 14, that got me crazy interested in the neurochemistry and the pharmacology of everything. And then once you find that Arrowhead DMT entry, it's game on and you're like, what is this stuff? And, uh, you know, and, and why don't, uh, why don't we move really quick before we dive all the way in? I want, I want you to take it away here and just give a little intro on DMT, such a magical little simple molecule and such a mystery what its other purposes are in nature i want to hear kind of the, the andrew gallimore 101 on dmt yeah uh where do i start i mean so dmt is this dimethyltryptamine um which is a uh, a plant alkaloid it's a, a ubiquitous plant alkaloid so it's found in countless plant species at high levels in certain um, outstanding species, but it's the simplest of all of the naturally occurring psychedelic molecules. Uh, whilst at the same time, it is also the most, in many ways, the most confounding, the most astonishing, the most fascinating, the most remarkable. Choose your superlative here. Um, it's this, it, Terence McKenna used to call it this 100% reality channel switch, which I think perfectly captures what DMT does. Um, it's uh, normally extracted from plant material. So you obtain a pure form, which is then usually vaporized and inhaled. And within 
30 seconds of um, it entering the bloodstream, your normal waking world is obliterated um, and replaced with a bizarre, hyper-technological, seemingly autonomous alien reality teeming with extremely strange, apparently highly intelligent, extremely powerful um, beings, creatures, entities, gods, aliens, call them what you want, but beings that are not of this earth, um, certainly not of this earth, um, and almost certainly also not of this universe, beings that defy, in many ways, categorization, that defy uh, being easily pinned down, beings that are so beyond anything that we could have anticipated or predicted, um, and beings that even if after we have been confronted by them that still seem to defy explanation uh, as to why this very simple plant alkaloid should gate access to the, this extremely bizarre uh, realm. Um, um, and it's also fascinating about DMT uh, is not just its kind of ubiquity in the natural world, but also the the efficiency, this kind of ferocious efficiency by which it has its effects. This is not a drug that in induces a kind of a, a psychotic break or a you know a drugged state, so to speak. It's as if it's it seems curiously at home in the human brain. The, this very efficient and clean switch. You often keep all of your faculties, so to speak, intact. And it's, it's as literally as if somebody has switched the channel, switched the reality, reality channel in your brain. Uh, and so your brain suddenly stops perceiving and constructing um, your normal model of reality, your normal waking world model, and suddenly starts constructing this bizarre alternate model that bears no relationship whatsoever to the world that you just lost. Um, um, you remain in this place for normally just a few minutes. You know, by, They say by the time you um, kind of get your bearings and realize what's happened, you're already on the way out again. You know, it's, it's a few minutes, five minutes really. Um, is the kind of the, the peak within the breakthrough state within the space, and then you're dragged back out again, uh, and then 15, you know, you, you might spend five or ten minutes raving and shocked, shaking, shaking to your very bones about what just happened, and then everything starts to fade, and you forget um, what 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 happened, uh, and another 10, 15 minutes, you're back down to base reality as if nothing happened. You know, this is why they call it the businessman's trip because it's, it's something that can, you ingest it, you're in this space and you're, you're pulled out again. And then within an hour total time, you're back in, in the normal waking consciousness that, uh, that you, that you started from. Um, so these are, these are all kind of unique, uh, pharmacological, and phenomenological peculiarities of this plant alkaloid that just happens to be the most common one that's scattered throughout the natural world. Also, just by coincidence, seems to have, or not seems, certainly does have these astonishing reality switch uh, properties. I think that covers most. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, another thing that I find fascinating are like, not only is DMT so ubiquitous in nature, but other classic psychedelic molecules and naturally occurring alkaloids are basically built around a DMT backbone. Talking about 5-MeO-DMT is just 5-methoxylated DMT under there. Psilocin is 4-hydroxylated DMT. You're just adding little bitty functional groups onto that very simple molecule and yep. altering its pharmac pharmacokinetics and just like everything about it. And uh, but ultimately, it's they're still building on the Lego block that is DMT. So I'm curious if you have concluded or landed on any conclusions 
or potentials on why it is that DMT is so prevalent throughout nature. It's produced in the human body. And what, like, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, again, this is, so DMT is, is produced from the, the essential amino acid tryptophan. So you, you start with tryptophan, which is this, this is obviously, you know, it's one of the 20, 21 main amino, amino acids from which proteins are constructed. Um, um, and it's, you only need two chemical steps. So you start with tryptophan, you decarboxylate it, you remove this carbon dioxide molecule from the tryptophan molecule, and that gives you tryptamine. And then it's a simple matter of adding two, two carbon atoms, basically, two methyl groups, um, and then you've got DMT. So it's, it's, it, in, in many ways, it's not surprising that so many plants can construct this. This is not some... I mean, there are many plant alkaloids that are very complex and that are only made by certain plants you know they take kind of special tools if you like or special sets of enzymes that are required to construct them things like morphine for example um, you're only going to find this in a very small number of plants or salvinorin from salvia divinorin and right. it's not an alkaloid but it's this complex molecule that only one plant makes whereas dmt is is completely different to that it's extremely simple um, you know, two steps from tryptophan. So, and, and the enzymes that you need are again ubiquitous. They're very common, simple enzymes that can be used to make other things as well. So, in in, the, in that way, it's it's not surprising that DMT is everywhere, including in the human body at certain levels. Um, so, what the interesting thing is not that it's everywhere. Um, but because if, if you just discovered as a plant scientist or a chemist this DMT molecule inside a plant, it would be completely uninteresting to you. It would just be this methylated tryptamine metabolite, uh, tryptophan metabolite. And you'd go, this is, this is almost expected. You would almost predict from its structure that this would be in lots of plants. Now, because it is so simple to make and it's so simply derived, easily derived from tryptophan. So the, the, the fascinating thing about it is that it also just happens to be this, um, the most efficient reality channel switch um, in, in the natural world whilst also being the simplest. So it's, it's that connection uh, there that's the most fascinating. Why? Why? Right. You know, is it really just a coincidence that this incredibly simple easily constructed molecule just happens to put you in touch with you know advanced alien intelligences in a hyper technological hyperdimensional uh, reality this bizarre place that bears no relationship to the normal waking world that to me still is one of the most fascinating and curious and um astonishing really uh, aspects of, of of dmt right yeah, that that also coupled with the fact that through various plant preparations like ayahuasca, uh, vilca, and yopo, uh, it's been being consumed in that fashion with knowledge that was obtained in some mysterious way for tens of thousands of years minimum. That's just the time period that we find ceremonial ayahuasca cups with traces of tryptamines and DMT. Um, uh, and bufotenin and other alkaloids as well and it's like this has been being done for so long and was discovered by somebody and you know we'll get into the the combinations and, and the admixtures of what these cultures are combining with the dmt and why uh, in a little bit but first i wanted to kind of just jump into the neurochemistry of it a little bit because as you were saying it's like so it's so simple it's so profound that it is so profound and it's like well we can kind of observe the way that it works within the brain observe the receptor affinities but that doesn't really explain to us how it has such a profound effect immediately on our consciousness and as you were saying it's so transient the body knows exactly what to do with dmt it's a trace it's a trace amine basically and so obviously we know that psychedelics bind to a variety of receptors mainly the one that gets the most focus kind of is the serotonin 2A receptor or the 5-HT2A receptor. And so 
basically is an agonist, um, replace it like plugs into the same keyhole. And essentially what it's doing is replacing the function of serotonin and seemingly in a, a dose responsive manner, it like reduces somehow the filtering mechanism of our brain. This is, these are interject, but these are, these are kind of where I'm at right now currently in my understanding. Um, and so by reducing that filtering mechanism, which is sometimes described as top down signal modulation, where our beliefs and expectations actually filter out our sensory input from the thalamus in real time. And our brain chooses in real time what is signal and what's noise, what's important to focus on and therefore led into my immediate awareness and what should I block out of reality. And so when that patterning, that top down modulation is interrupted, um, that that could be one of the facets of what's happening here. But ultimately what's happening is it's it's plugging into the same keyhole that serotonin plugs into and in some way, shape or form, like we might be able to observe that there's changes in electrical signaling, perhaps changes in the electromagnetic oscillation frequency. So like our brainwave state, but how do these things cause like actually literally surreal effects, metaphysical, it could be, could, could be a word used there effects. Like, Obviously, there are other receptors involved as well, like the sigma-1 receptor and the trace amine-associated receptor, and then the downstream consequences of those receptors. So it, it's a lot more complex than just the serotonin 2A receptor, but that does apparently, and correct me if I'm wrong, it seems to be the one that is the main causes of the sensory input changes. Um, I'm curious, just like, what's your take on how that is possible in the brain? I know it's like poorly understood worldwide, but mm. how can just replacing serotonin and somewhat removing serotonin from the equation in your neurochemistry cause such a drastic change in our perception? Is there an understanding behind that? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I have a fairly robust picture of what's going on. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's, it's a little bit complicated, but so, I mean, you have to start from the fact that, as you said, your, your, your reality, your world that you experience is, is this model that's being constructed by your brain from patterns of neural information. Um, so, so even in normal waking life, when you're just kind of experiencing the world in a normal sober fashion, this, your world is this model. It's an internally generated model. Um, and it's constantly, but it's constantly being modulated and tested really against sensory information. So your brain has this model of, of the world that you experience, and it's it's basically trying to predict patterns of sensory information. And and when a, and if its predictions are correct, then it, it basically blocks that sensory information. It doesn't it doesn't need it any doesn't need it. So it only allows a small trickle of information in these what's called surprising information, unpredicted information. That's what actually makes it into the brain. And then the brain can kind of update its model. So it's this constant cycle of model construction and model testing against sensory information. So that's happening all the time. This is your base uh, world construction state. Um, so when DMT enters the brain, as you said, it's binding primarily, and we know this, uh, from you know you can block this 5-HT2A receptor, for example, and you will block the effects of the classic psychedelics. And this has been done with LSD. It's been done with psilocybin. I'm not sure if it's actually been done with DMT, but I expect to see the same effect. Um, so we know that the primary locus of effects is this 5-HT2A receptor. So when DMT or any classic psychedelic is binding to the 5-HT2A receptor, um, which are heavily expressed in certain types of neurons in the deep layers of the cortex. And this basically, it, it's, it's kind of, it excites these neurons, it increases their excitability, uh, and it delivers this kind of perturbation uh, of, uh, of neural activity. It, it perturbs the world model and disrupts it. Uh, and when you you do that when you disrupt this world model this model that your brain is constructing a number of things happen um so the simplest one kind of effect to explain is you're getting a 
if the model is disrupted, it becomes less efficient in or less able to make good predictions about sensory information. Um, so a lot more sensory information kind of gets through that filter, if you like. Um, and so you get the brain becomes much more sensitive to incoming sensory information. Um, there's also a disruption of um, subcortical areas. So these are the, the older areas of the brain um, that are involved in uh, emotional processing um, and also memory uh, and probably the site of what people often refer to as the collective unconscious, these deep inherited neural structures, they also become kind of disinhibited. So information can start flowing upwards um, uh, into these higher areas of the brain as well as flowing in from um, the environment. Um, so that's kind of your, um, your classic psychedelic effect. You, the world model becomes disrupted. It, it shifts from being stable and predictable um, to being much more fluid and dynamic and unpredictable uh, and also much more sensitive to incoming sensory data. So this is how you might describe a low-dose LSD or psilocybin trip uh, in that the world becomes more fluid and dynamic. The, the identity of objects changes before the eyes. You know, your, your brain's model of the world is changing, basically, uh, and becoming much more sensitive to information from elsewhere, from the environment or from deeper cortical structures. But with DMT, something quite different happens. It seems to kind of push through that uh, and, and kind of collapse into constructing this entirely novel model. Um, so the world model, um, your brain is... Your world model emerges. It's an emergent structure, an emergent pattern of neural activity. So it's all the time your world model is 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 emerging um, at, at the at the the peak, at the, uh, the pinnacle of this hierarchy of complexity, from neurons to neural networks, all the way up to the, the world model at, at the cortical level. Uh, and what you often see with um, complex systems is that when you deliver a particular perturbation, highly precise one, um, the the emergent activity kind of collapses into an entirely new type of behavior, um, and and that's what seems to be happening with DMT. Is it, it's suddenly you get this like a like a phase transition really, uh, where it shifts from constructing this normal waking world model to constructing this completely different model um uh, and so that's also kind of what's fascinating about dmt is why you know why is that so this perturbation this stimulation of these 5-HT2A receptors why does that cause this sudden transition uh, not just to any any old kind of new model but actually this very specific coherent crystalline clear uh, hyperdimensional reality filled with these intelligent beings. Um, so that's what's changing. Um, people, there's often, when people ask about DMT or think about DMT, the old question that often comes up is, is, is it real? Uh, is it all in your head uh, or is it real? And this is really a, a bad question. It's a poorly formulated question because the world model is always constructed. It's always all in your head, so to speak. Um, uh, in that the, the world that you experience is always be, is always this model that's being internally generated. So the real question here is: Is the DMT world like the normal waking world being modulated? Is it being tested against some external source of information? So, in other words, when you when your brain is constructing the DMT world, are you actually interfacing in some way? Is your brain receiving information from some al alternate information source, which we might consider to be some other reality, wherever that might be and whatever nature or form uh, that, might, uh, that might take? And that question is, in my opinion, still open. Where is the information coming from? Um, for the brain to be able to construct this world. This is not just a random um, alternate reality that you're kind of hurtled into. It's a very specific, highly coherent uh, place that has 
extremely unusual geometry and topology and structure that contains incredibly intelligent beings. Um, that is not simple to explain. It's simple to explain why your world model might be disrupted by a psychedelic like DMT. It's not simple to explain uh, is why. You know, it's kind of like um, if you if you want in you know, one of those old TV sets with the dial, maybe you're not old enough to remember those. But when I was a little kid, we had a, a TV set um that was a black and white thing and you to change the channel you had to turn the dial I was first, here for that. Was, yeah <laughs> you were there for that <laughs> and it would you know when you first turn the dial it would the, the, the image would break down and it would then it would just be white noise and then as you keep turning it this brand new image would crackle into view as you you switch to the new new channel so that's so the classic psychedelics is kind of like turning that dial yeah and getting the white noise and that's like, okay, we can explain that. It's just disrupting the brain's ability to construct its, its world model. But then you find this new channel. That's the difficult thing. And it's not just any old new channel. It's, it's a very clear and specific new channel that you've constructed. So it's kind of like doing that and then realizing that your aerial has been disconnected. Um, and it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. This doesn't make any sense now because your brain is constructing this entirely novel, coherent world. Um, how does it do that without access to some information? Because the world we experience, the normal waking world, it's definitely modulated by information. We know it seems to be you know, being tested. It has access to information from the environment. So how does it switch to constructing an entirely new model without access to some extrinsic data source? Uh, and so that's, that's what I'm particularly interested in, is trying to understand how that can work and whether there is some alternate sensory information sensory data source and if so how is the brain receiving it um, what is special about you know what's going on there that it's very difficult to explain within um, the standard paradigm of, of neuroscience uh, to explain how the brain could receive information from some other place what's the relationship between our brain, our reality, and this um, nearby, so to speak, uh, other reality within which these entities reside. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. That is, that's the quadrillion dollar question. There's, there's no doubt about it. You just touched on a lot mm -hmm. of points that, that I was going to bring up as well, you know, regarding usually the brain is constructing our reality internally based on all of this external data, which is very clearly you know, I might be experiencing it subjectively, but in all fronts, it appears to objectively be here. And my sensory mm -hmm. perceptual organs are most definitely exposed to it. And so, you know, my experience of it is always limited by literally the frequency bandwidth limitations of our sensory organs, meaning the frequencies we can hear, the frequencies of light that are visible to us, etc. And then our perceptual circuitry that you were describing. So, it's like, since we seem to also be able to build these worlds internally with entheogens like DMT, while being quote unquote devoid of sensory information, like what does that say about the good old fashioned theory of the brain being more of an antenna than a consciousness generator? Because as you were saying, it's like when you change the channel and it comes into, into being and it's not random, it's highly cohesive, like you were saying, well, one, one might say, well, that's pareidolia. That's the human's tendency to for pattern recognition. But that kind of falls apart whenever people are having extraordinarily similar experiences, encounters with extraordinarily complex beings that you can, I know you can't really categorize them, but people describe them in very much the same way. And there are some that are kind of, are kind of unmistakable, such as the mantid beings. But it's like, what is what does this say about? I mean, what 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 kind of fields does this open up? And from a physics standpoint, from I mean, so many aspects of science, from a historical standpoint, and then, you know, regarding like one possibility that occurred to me when you were just saying, well, like where could that information be coming from? Have, have you read the book The Cosmic Serpent by Jeremy Narby? Yes. Yeah. A long so time like. Ago, yeah. 
Yeah, and I I really resonate with with that model and explanation due to my own experiences with ayahuasca and it always being such a genetic based experience for me. I'm consistently having these experiences where I'm like buried in my genetic material and it's really tricky and interesting because the the visions that I'm having are actually like a multi-stable perception. If you're familiar with like those pictures where it's either like a vase or it's two faces looking mm. at each other, nothing changes except your perception or the cube that's either facing this way or that way. So now that it's happened so many times, when I dive into ayahuasca, I can switch my perception and what might be a complex scene of something happening, I can see behind it and it's double helix, like literally genetic material. And so, you know, one of my biggest kind of wonders and something that's so awe-inspiring is like when we're in these states, are we interfacing with our with information contained within what I would assume to be the huge portion of DNA that's not 3D printing us into being by, you know, creating physical proteins, but is very clearly information containing as well. Here in America, obviously, we like to call it junk because we don't understand it, but there's clearly mm. something going on there. But it's like, I mean, not like just saying, America either. Yeah, I think that's, they, they, they now call it non-coding DM, uh, non-coding DNA because yeah, people better were than offended. Offended yeah. by the term junk DNA, and for good reason. It's it's a it's a stupid uh, way to describe. Obviously, you know DMT. Um, God, I keep saying DMT. It's got DMT on the brain. Um, so, DNA. Uh, obviously, it's it, your 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 body is is kind of efficient. It has evolved. Um, so the idea that you have this very very high percentage of DNA that's junk um, right. is is obviously extremely unlikely because you know, it takes a lot of energy to be constructing these long DNA chains. Mm. Um, so, so just to pick up on a, a couple of points you made there. Um, so firstly about, um, you know, the world that you, you know, you said, as I said, that this DMT world, this alternate reality is, um, very, very cohesive. It's very coherent. It's very particular, and it's it's it bears no relationship to this normal waking world. Now we know that the brain can construct a world model in the absence of sensory information. Every time you go to sleep at night, when you dream, your brain is constructing a model of the world. It, it's in fact it's building the world in pretty much the same way. It's using the same information. It's the same model. Um, you know, your brain evolved. Again, getting back to evolution, your brain evolved uh, to construct a model of reality. Your brain knows, as far as we're aware, it knows how to construct one model. And that's the model of the environment. Um, it's the only model that your brain should know how to construct. Um, it's like your brain only learned one language, and it spent millions of years evolving to, to, to speak that language, to construct this particular model of the environment. Um, and so what's confounding about DMT is that suddenly, in the presence of this simple molecule, your brain becomes capable of constructing an entirely different model um, that is coherent, that is cohesive, um, that is corroborated in terms of its structure and its content by large numbers of people. So it's, it's kind of like, um, if a five-year-old British child only speaks English, suddenly flipped and started speaking fluent Mandarin or something, or some weird South African click language, um, mm -hmm. it, it would be it would be confounding. That would be like that's impossible. How did he learn to speak that language? And your brain is doing that. It's it's speaking a completely different language. It's constructing an entirely different world model with great efficiency, um, despite not having evolved to construct that world model. So there is um, there's something extremely difficult to explain there. We do need to start to consider, I think, the possibility that um, there is some alternate source of information here that the DMT is for reasons that we can't really explain yet. Gating access, gating the flow of information from some other place. Is that something to do with, um, uh, with DNA 
Uh, I don't know. Um, I don't think anyone's provided. I mean, there's been a lot of speculation. So, you know, Jeremy Narby, of course, and many other people have picked up on this idea as well, um, that, that DNA might be acting as some kind of antenna, if you want to use that word. Um, but nobody's really provided a good mechanistic, solid, clear explanation. So I think there's there's a number of explanations, a number of possibilities that are kind of thrown around as, po as, as possible explanations for of how that information might be being received by the brain. Um, but I think we're, we're, we're triangulating, I think, onto the correct question at least. And that's the most important thing. We have to re we have to formulate the question properly first, uh, and that's where we've struggled. I think as as, mm -hmm. as humans is to know wh where's the problem here, where's the sticking point in our explanation. And I think that, in my opinion, after a couple of decades of thinking about this, this is where the the problem lies: is wh where is this? How is this information being received? If there is some if, if the, you know, the DMT world is indeed some autonomous reality and that we are able to gain access to it, how is that information being received? Um, what's that, what is that relationship between our normal world and this alternate world? Where's this interface? Um, how is this information being transferred, transmitted, received um, from this other place into the brain? And there, there, we don't have the answers yet. Right. What do you what do you think about the possibility that it could be changing that frequency bandwidth of what we are able to perceive of the electromagnetic spectrum and then possibly, you know, stepping into the ability to be able to perceive, say, like a, a, a separate octave of bandwidth of that spectrum? Obviously, we're buried in so much electromagnetic radiation. We our sensory organs aren't tuned to perceive. So, like, I guess in that one. In that model, it would it would almost be that the worlds, or it could be possibly, I guess, that the worlds that you're interfacing with are potentially overlaid in this same space if it were to exist in there. But that you know, it's it's everything is operating at a different octave. Is that sound even feasible in your framework? I think it's 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 a good analogy. It's a good metaphor. I think I don't think it's as simple as that. I mean, if it was. Other, I mean, people have often said, you know, is it is it a different part of the electromagnetic spectrum that your brain is suddenly able to receive? Well, if that were the case, we should be able to detect these worlds using ultra, you know, ultraviolet or other frequency detection mechanisms. You know, we've got equipment now that can detect different frequencies of all, you know, all the frequencies of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we'd find clues there. We don't. I don't think the answer is going to be so simple. I think it, that. That's very um, human level ways of thinking about it. You know, it's right. overly simplistic to think that oh, it's just a different. But it's it's a good way. It's a good metaphor as long as we don't take that literally. It's a good metaphor in that clearly uh, there is a greater expanse of information um, that the brain is receiving. It's some alternate information source. Um, but I don't think we're going to find it in just in different frequencies of electromagnetic radiation. I think it's something much deeper and something that's much more beyond uh, current descriptions, beyond our current model, about a current kind of reality paradigm, if you like. Right. And that's where things are going to have to change, is in our fundamental understanding of what we are, what, what we are a part of. You know, I, I, I always say that our reality is this very thin slice of this much larger, more complex structure. DMT is opening up, um, uh, gating access to this larger structure, uh, such that we temporarily become part of this higher dimensional um, complex structure, and we're starting to receive information from it. Right. What you said regarding, and again, I'm just like tossing out models of possibilities, but what you said regarding the uh, like instruments to be able to detect the different frequencies, what occurred to me when you said that, and I'm, uh, I'd like you to like answer how this, whether or not you feel like this would be still feasible, is like if an instrument that's not conscious can can detect it, how do you think that they would find clues versus that 
information being there still, but not being able to be integrated into that world builder of the human brain or mind or psyche. You know what I mean? That's like two different things, it existing versus us perceiving it as a world or integrating that information. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly true uh, in the, it, the it's it's a, um, the, the subjective experience of receiving. Obviously, uh, you know, if you detect light using an instrument, you might see particular patterns of light, but that's obviously very different to um, the actual experience of, of light. You know, the way that we experience the world is obviously quite different to what you would detect. Uh, but I, I just don't think um, that, it, to me, it just doesn't seem like a satisfactory explanation that, it, that it's simply about different channels uh, different channels of the electromagnetic spectrum to me that seems like a very human centric um almost obvious explanation you know it's like oh that's just too easy um i think I, i think to find the true explanation requires some really quite deep uprooting of our fundamental ontological assumptions of our fundamental picture of uh, of reality and how it's constructed and what's our relationship to this larger structure. Um, I don't think, unfortunately, you know, it would be nice if we could say that uh, they, they exist within, um, you know, alternate um, regions of the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum, but I, I just don't think that's the case. These, these worlds are... Um, so complex they're so different to the normal waking world in many different ways not just in terms of the entities um uh, the kind of the intelligence within the space but also its structure this it seems to possess people often describe as as you did um, many more spatial dimensions it seems to be not just strange or bizarre or unusual uh, but actually actively impossible these are impossible domains they cannot exist um (laughs) um, that's in my opinion from my own perspective and i know from terence mckenna's perspective when he first smoked dmt back in the 1960s uh, it was being confronted with not just the strange but the truly impossible Um, it is impossible for you to experience the dmt experience is impossible it's the simplest way to to put it and yet there it is Uh, there's this great line from john mack's book abduction i think it was abduction one of his volunteers experience said "I'm, i'm not telling you it's possible i'm telling you it happened um that's that's it uh it's not possible um it's it's not possible <laughs> so i keep saying that mm-hmm. but that's that, that's a kind of an important point here these experiences should not occur they should not be po- it should not be possible for a human to experience these worlds and yet here we are um yeah. it's something you know, like so special around the world <laughs> yeah and something so special about what you're saying right now as opposed to like other other things that, you know, rely on belief or faith or whatever. It's like, no one has to believe anything about what anybody says about DMT. It's like the pipes right there, figure it out. And then you'll realize the the impossible, you know, and, uh, you know, another thing that that's coming up that is also adds to the layers of mystery here is the fact that there are modulators to this experience that entirely change the world that is constructed. For instance, in ayahuasca, for instance, in Vilca, there, there are these concoctions of various alkaloids and, and you know, routes of administration. Obviously, ayahuasca is ingested orally. And so, uh, you know, the special molecules in ayahuasca are, uh, in the beta carboline group, they're called harmalas, harmine, harmaline, tetrahydroharmine. And they're really special molecules. And for some reason, again, not answerable to anybody, they, in my experience, when combining harmine or harmaline or tetrahydroharmine with DMT in any form or fashion, whether you smoke it and you've orally or sublingually taken a harmala, um, whether you smoke it with the harmalas in it or whether it's prepared in a brew like ayahuasca, 
the way that I like to describe it is that it takes the DMT, which by itself tends to be very bizarre and technological and outer spacey and galactic and cosmic in nature. And the, the Harmalas seem to tune the DMT experience to like channel Earth. And suddenly everything is way more nature centric. There are also countless reports in, in my own experience of visions of ancient cultures, be it Egypt to South American, Mesoamerican, Mayan, Aztec imagery and you know, animals from jaguars to snakes to birds, all of this stuff is, it, it's just an entirely different world that you're stepping into whenever the harmalas are in the mix. And again, it's, it doesn't matter whether you, whether you smoke the DMT with, with the harmalas in your blood. And so, you know, obviously har harmine and harmaline are monoamine oxidase inhibitors. They inhibit the enzyme that would otherwise eat DMT up right when it hit your stomach and uh and they allow it to be orally active but there's also clearly something else going on there and earlier like on the tip that I was talking regarding about my DNA experiences that actually I'm not sure that it's actually ever happened with just DMT but um I really really love the cut we call it vapor wasca the combination of taking a harmala about an hour or so prior orally about an hour or so prior to smoking DMT. And that's essentially like smokable ayahuasca. And so between that experience, whether I'm smoking the DMT with the harmalas in my blood or whether I'm drinking ayahuasca, that's when those DNA experiences tend to, to come up. And it's almost every time in some form or fashion. And so in reading some studies about harmine, I found out that it's been shown to actually intercalate into and therefore bind with DNA as well as interfering with an enzyme called topoisomerase, which is an enzyme that basically affects DNA transcription and replication and stuff like that. So it's like if this molecule is directly interacting with DNA, is that what I'm witnessing somehow is like a big question that's come up for me. Do you know anything about the, the effects of harmalos on DNA that you shed some light on? Um, well, sure. There's, I mean, this idea... I mean, Terence McKenna was talking about in, intercalation. So the, so the DNA, um, for those that don't know, you have this double helix and these, um, these bases that are connected across like a ladder that's also twisted. And these, these DNA bases, so adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine, they're flat. So they're stacked like this, one above the other. Um, uh, and harmine is also... Um, this very flat molecule, as is DMT, actually has this flat indole ring, and so the idea is that it can insert, it can slide in between the rungs, if you like, of this ladder. And there are many molecules that do this, and many, many very important drug molecules. So, anti chemotherapeutic agents, for example, they will often insert between these DNA bases and disrupt um, the the proper function of the DNA. So the, the unwinding, the replication, uh, all of these processes. DNA is a very dynamic molecule. It's not just like a, a written record or something. It's a very dynamic molecule. It's constantly being wound up and unwound and replicated and repaired. Um, you know, you have this whole apparatus molecular apparatus that's involved in keeping dna working packing it and unpacking it unwinding it pulling it apart putting stitching it back together replicating it, all this kind of stuff and any molecule that gets in and interferes with that system um it can you know severely disrupt a cell and this is how you know, these anti-cancer drugs work they stop these rapidly dividing cells from rapidly dividing and triggers them to basically commit cell suicide or apoptosis um slight different issue but anyway um so so yeah so so going back to Terence McKenna you know, when he wrote the invisible landscape I think it was and in true hallucinations as well a wonderful book um he also puts forth this idea that that, that, that either the harmines uh, harmaline or, or, or perhaps even DMT itself is interacting with the DMT, so with the DNA uh, molecule in some way, and that this could be responsible for some of its effects. I don't think it's been 
borne out. I don't think this explanation, anyone has been able to provide an explanation for other than the DNA, DNA type experiences um, that you get with um, with ayahuasca, which Jeremy Narby written extensively about. Uh, I think it, it's still very much unexplored, unexplained territory. The in the last, you know, three, four, five decades, ever since really we discovered the 5-HT2A receptor as being the the active uh, locus for the classic psychedelic effects, that's where the focus has been, is being on the 5-HT2A receptor, as well as an array of other receptors. So, and I think that it explains a lot of, of why different psychedelics have different effects, because you, you, you're, each of these neurons, these brain cells, from which your your cortex is constructed is this highly complex system with this this array of receptor sites all over the surface um, that are speaking to that are interacting with this highly complex subcellular network of molecules and they're always controlling the neurons like the switchboard different molecules will bind to different receptors bind to different switches and change that kind of configuration if you like um, of of that particular subcellular perturbation of the neuron uh, and that will ultimately affect um, the way that the neuron behaves and functions in a, in a very distinct way and then when you have different neurons individually functioning and behaving differently in the way they communicate with each other this disrupts the overall structure of the world model so so that is still an area of of of, of intense research and so it's not surprising really that that's become the focus of of how we explain psychedelics and i think we're doing quite a good job it's by focusing on the different receptors that are being um that are being stimulated uh, by different types of psychedelic molecule so the this old well, quite old now idea of of dna in, in intercalation is one that has fallen by the wayside. Um, so you, you, you would need um, quite a brave and kind of an intrepid biochemist to really start to think about, you know, how harmine could be um, uh, modulating the, the DMT state uh, when it's also present at the same time as DMT. Uh, I think there's just so much we don't know about what that could be beyond, as you say, the, the phenomenological differences. Uh, I don't think it's straightforward to explain why these certain much more organic type phenomenology tends to be more prevalent when you've got, um, you know, not just in a jungle setting, for example, when you've you, you've mm-hmm. drunk ayahuasca, but even in a, a just a normal. Um, suburban setting when you you mix the harmalines with dmt it is so phenomenologically different in a quite distinct way um that's um something that i don't think we know too much about i don't i don't man i can't like conceive of a line of questioning to design an experiment to even get to the bottom of that. I mean, the study that I was talking about was researching harmine for anti-tumor properties. Uh, as you were saying, it's using certain chemotherapies and whatnot, or intercalation yep. helps with that process. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the study I read had nothing to do with DMT whatsoever. And like, I, I, I don't know how to even ask that question. All I do know is that experientially, not only for myself, but for, I mean, I would imagine damn near everybody who has done either they'll, they'll tell you the same thing. It's like a much more earthbound experience. So it's like brings you back to kind of like the, the metaphor of the, of the antenna. And is it somehow like tuning your consciousness or DMT or the brain or whatever, whether it's in your DNA or not, it's, it's just so interesting to ponder. But yeah, I mean, like we kind of keep landing on, I mean, we really have no idea other than yeah. some of the specific neurochemical binding affinities and, and shit like that. But, I wanted to ask you a little bit too, uh, before I forget, about the DMTX program, which is a research program you're involved in that is going to explore extended state DMT, uh, I believe, via IV drips, correct? Mm. 
Yes. So, um, so as we said at the beginning, DMT is this very fleeting experience. You, you're you're hurtled into this strange domain. You you look around wide eyed for a few minutes, kind of disoriented, shocked, appalled, uh, horrified, <laughs> um, bewildered, um, and then you're kind of dragged out again. And so it's it's not this normal route of vaporization is very efficient and for most people it's more than enough uh, most people are quite happy with five minutes in that space um, but if we do take seriously the idea which i do and i know you do um, that we are interfacing with some other reality that's worthy of exploration right this is for sure whatever the nature of the dmt space whether it really is purely a wild cortical fabrication uh, or if it really is interfacing with another reality whatever the answer to that question there's no doubt that this is a uh, an, an incredible uh, an incredibly strange and, and, and un unusual state of consciousness and it should be explored um, and proper exploration of this space and communication establishing two-way communication with the beings that are resident within the space um, that should be uh, a, a a topic of of, of, uh, of intense study. Uh, we sh we should certainly take that as a research project any day of the week, right? Um, no doubt about that. So the question then is, well, how do we go about that? Uh, I don't think it, it's not sufficient to be just kind of hurtled burst into this place and then remain there just for a few minutes you need to be able to enter the space uh, orient yourself allow the space to stabilize which it seems to do over time um, and, and remain there um, within the space for much longer periods of time you know 30 minutes mm -hmm. an hour two hours as, as long as you need and so to do that you need to um, you need a, a technology that allows you to maintain a stable brain DMT con concentration over time. So that was my original thinking way back in 2000, well, I say way back, uh, 2015, so a few years ago back uh, now, um, I was, and this is also another interesting thing about DMT actually, uh, is that when you give someone DMT, Rick Strassman did this study back in, in the early 90s with his landmark human dmt study he showed that if you inject someone with dmt um, and then measure the intensity of their experience so they fill out this hallucinogen rating scale uh, then you inject them again 30 minutes later uh, and then again 30 minutes later what you don't see that you see with other psychedelics uh, is this kind of reduction this tolerance acute tolerance effect where the level the intensity of the experience drops off over time. With DMT, it remains exactly the same, the same intensity every time. So there's no subjective tolerance to the experience, which is another kind of curiosity, this pharmacological peculiarity of DMT beyond its weird effects, um, is that there's the lack of any subjective tolerance. So it occurred to me that this molecule, its pharmacokinetic properties, how it's metabolized, how it gets into the brain, uh, the, the, bre the brevity of its effects, this lack of subjective tolerance, these are all properties of drugs, anesthetic drugs, um, in terms of the metabolism, etc. It's the properties of these anesthetic drugs that are used in um, during surgery. So in if you undergo a um, some kind of surgical operation when they put you under general anesthesia, they use this technology called target-controlled intravenous infusion. So the target here is a certain brain concentration. Uh, and they, they use this mathematical model of the way that the molecule, the drug, the anesthetic drug is distributed and metabolized in your body and in your brain um, to, um, to program this intravenous infusion drip, this intravenous infusion device um, that that introduces DMT into your bloodstream at this um, mathematically informed rate such that the level rises, the level of the drug, the anesthetic drug rises in the brain, then it remains fairly stable over time. And you can 
control the level as well to push someone deeper into anesthesia, or you can bring them to a lower level depending on the requirements of surgery, etc. Uh, and so it occurred to me that this is precisely what we need with DMT. Why can't we just mm. develop this same model, but instead of for an anesthetic drug, we'll develop it for DMT. So then you bring some, then you can, ideally, you can induce somebody into the DMT state, hold them there, and keep them there for an indefinite period of time, um, for 30 minutes, for an hour, or longer. Um, so I, I contacted Rick um, uh, because I knew that he, he had the the blood sampling data. So when he did his study in the in the 90s, he would he would take blood samples every few minutes, measure the, the blood DMT concentration. So I knew he, he, he at least back then in the 90s he had that data because it was published. So I asked him and I said, I, I have this idea, um, but I need some data from you. Do you have this data? Um, and um, within about 15 minutes, you know, he's very efficient at replying. Uh, he sent this Excel file, which had all of the all of the blood data from this study. So I knew that we kind of had what we needed. So then we worked together on this paper, uh, published it um, uh, the following year. Um, the Basically provided a kind of proof of principle that this technology would work with DMT, that you could use it to, um, in, to, do, to induce somebody into the DMT state and actually keep them there for as long as you wanted really um so that was back in 2016 we published the paper it got a lot of attention everyone was kind of talking about it um you know the, the potential of this technology and imperial college london have literally just finished um late last year the the first study in humans using what's come to be known as dmtx extended state dmt um, so they, I think it's more like a pilot study that they they just completed. So a small number of volunteers you know, mm. held, holding them within the DMT space for like thirty minutes, allowing the state to stabilize. They're able to actually maintain, uh, having looked at the data, they can actually maintain a stable intensity of experience. So you're not normally when you when you take DMT, it rises very rapidly in the brain and then it it drops exponentially back down again so yeah. you have this normal time course of effects but they're able to actually uh, hold somebody at a, a breakthrough state for you know or lower states as well so different intensities of states but met, keep it stable um for at least 30 minutes and there's no reason why that that won't be extended to you know an hour or two hours or however long you want so it gives you time basically to um, get your intellective tools in order to orient yourself, to allow the brain to settle into mm -hmm. constructing this this space. Um, you know, it's very disorienting at first. You know, the, when, you, when the brain initially switches, um, but then it it was my prediction that it would actually your brain would kind of settle into constructing this alternate reality model, and then you would be able to navigate and explore uh, the space. Uh, much more efficiently, uh, as well as you know, potentially performing experiments within the space, interacting in real time between the DMT space and a team waiting on the other side, uh, establishing communication with the beings, you know, extracting information from them, delivering information to you know mathematicians and linguists and anthropologists and theologians and artists uh, waiting on the other side. Uh, so it, it opens up a, a a vast field of new research, um, mm -hmm. which is the exploration, mapping, and uh, experimentation and communication with this um, alternate uh, reality. Um, so it's very exciting, I think, um, the potential no, of this kind of research. No doubt, dude. When I first when I first started reading about the DMTX program, I was my instinctual reaction was I've been fucking training for this. <laughs> that was the first thing. I was like just so glad to see that this is being done. And like I'm curious, are are there any um specific ontologies or specific kind of 
cat- categories of things you y'all are looking to map out with like at first I guess is there is that organized yet or is it still just early stage where where's that at or can you talk about that or not so so I'm not directly I mean I'm not directly part so there's basically there's two oh okay there's two main I mean I, I consult a little bit um I'm more involved in um, the DM, the original, well, I guess the original DMTX program, which is in Boulder, Colorado. So this is a non-academic group, medicinal mindfulness, headed by Daniel McQueen up in Boulder. Um, so they they were the first really to pick up on this, um, but it's uh, they they're approaching it, I guess, in a manner that's closest to my original vision, and that it was for establishing communication. Uh, and for with these alien intelligences or these other alternate intelligences within the, within the space, um, but obviously it's very difficult being a non-academic organization, non non-academic group to um, to get this kind of thing off the ground. Um, if you're a university and you have an established psychedelic research group um, linked to a university hospital, it's much easier. So Imperial College have got massive head start there so it's not surprising um that imperial college are kind of uh, leading the not the race that's the wrong word but are kind of uh, uh, have been able to to get this off the ground much more quickly um so they're 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 kind of the imperial college team you know one of the world's leading psychedelic research groups um are um are kind of handling the more academic side you know they're they're leaning in the more orthodox um, scientific approach to how we might use this, mm-hmm. this molecule uh, and 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 study the the, the phenomenology and then the neuroscience uh, of of the DMT state whereas the the team in Boulder who are um, obviously many more obstacles to um, to surpass um, are more interested in the kind of establishing communication with these intelligences. So that's 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 I'm more involved with with that team uh, over there than I am with the um, the Imperial College uh, group. You know, I'm I'm in Tokyo, so I'm not injecting people with DMT over here and things like this. Um, I guess I was myself and Rick were responsible for kind of catalyzing the the interest um and, and lighting that spark really um about the potential of this this technology and so i think you're going to see in the future uh, there's another group in basel and switzerland uh, matthias leakty is also um seems to be in the early stages at least of some extended state dmt work so i think you're going to see groups popping up mm-hmm. in the future all over the world um you know this is not my technology by any stretch of the imagination it's um i don't have any ownership of it at all uh, it was just an idea um that it's kind of wonderful to see that it's starting to flourish and that people are really sort of picking up the mantle mm-hmm. uh, and see potential of it um so you know who knows what the next five five or ten years are going to look like in in dmt research i um from both i think it's important that we have both the very academic groups working in you know in uh, universities but also these slightly more far out you might say uh groups that are th- approaching it from a slightly different angle i think um, right. That's where we will we will get the answers. I think is where those 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 approaches meet. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, that's incredible. I'm really stoked to see how that turns out. And if it's not obvious, uh, I volunteer. So if you hear anything going on, please <laughs> let me know. I'm in. If that's not entirely obvious right now, uh, in actuality. Um, I've actually never told this story publicly at all, but on the winter solstice of 2014, I uh, IV'd DMT. Actually, Brooke IV'd me. Uh, I've never IV'd anything ever, so I spent the whole couple couple days trying to figure out how to keep myself safe. But I actually calculated my dose based on the spirit, the the Strassman trials, and uh, it was 
it was I'm saying this to to say that it was so different in caliber of intensity even than some of my stronger vaporized experiences it was it was definitely one of the peak experiences of my life it's not something i've repeated and it's not and i don't really actually even feel the need to but um i essentially was flung so hard so fast that uh i was in front of these three these three beings that i could only describe as uh, closest like description I can come up to is, is Seraphim and they were holding these like flashcard things in front of me and this these flashcards were full of this language this written language that looked like a combination of like Hebrew, Sanskrit and then the closest alphabet I've been able to find on the multiple year rabbit hole this led me down is the Khmer alphabet and each one of these little symbols they were showing me was like conveying so like information overload to me, but I got the really convincing sense that the information that was being conveyed, that this language has the ability to like convey information without distorting it. Uh, and strangely enough, like what, what, what it seemed was being communicated to me as I was looking at these like characters was that this language is some sort of like subconscious, like fundamental bite or bit of like quantum perceptual data. Like this is like the language that our subconscious mind uses to write our perceptual understanding of our sensory input or some shit like that. It was crazy. But anyway, that was definitely one of the top five wildest experiences of my life. And I've had quite a bit of wild experiences. So I, I'm definitely a volunteer. Let me <laughs> in. Let me know. I'll be there. But um, yeah, man, it's, I mean, I agree, like exploring these things, removing the taboo nature of the blanket term drugs, I think is of paramount importance. And I am just amazed and so happy to see the narrative change over the last couple of years, ever since institutions like John Hopkins and you know MAPS, everybody's been putting in this work the right, the right way to be able to change a preconceived notion. Um, you know, ever since the war on drugs got started, drugs have been looked at in such a different way and just over generalized to where we're we're calling stuff like meth and heroin the same term as we're describing something that's very clearly a molecular biotechnology that is allowing for Mm -hmm. altered states of consciousness so profound that like you were saying earlier it's not even possible by any stretch of the imagination you cannot prepare yourself for the bizarreness the intensity and the caliber of paradigm shattering that some of these tryptamines are especially dmt and you know, also 5-MeO DMT. Have you done any research or know much about 5-MeO? Because it's an entirely different experience of equal or even greater profundity. Yeah, so 5-MeO, it's remarkable. I mean, chemically, it's also remarkable in that it is a very simple. I mean, if you go from DMT, you you add a hydroxyl group, an OH, on that 5 position on the indole ring, and you've got bifotenine, which isn't... In, in my opinion, particularly interesting. Uh, mm. And studies on that have gone back to the 1950s. Um, so DMT is incredible, visual, extremely complex, visually rich. You add a hydroxyl group, you get 5-hydroxy-DMT or bifotenine, which isn't particularly interesting. So you have mm. this kind of this kind of waste, this kind of no-man's land in between. And then you add a methyl group to that bifotenine, you've got 5-MeO-DMT. And that is... Uh, as interesting as DMT, but for completely different Mm -hmm. reasons. Um, So here you have a molecule that is completely or largely non-visual, more of a kind of white light experience. My friend described it as like DMT is the fifth dimension and 5-MeO is like the 12th dimension. It's like you push past all of that form, all of that rich content and higher dimensional structure and you push past that, and you're then you're into this formless realm. Um, so again, again, a short, relatively short-acting, highly potent molecule uh, that causes a, a completely disjoint state of consciousness to the normal waking world, uh, and also completely different, completely disjoint to the DMT world. Um, so that's another piece of the puzzle it's another part of this picture that we need to explain what is the relationship between the dmt world and the five meo dmt world um and then 
we can say, well, let's bring in salvia. Let's bring in salvinorin from these, from this from salvia divinorum, this Mexican herb that's found only in these cloud forests in certain parts of Mexico, right? Uh, well, originally, anyway. Now it's kind of grown by everybody. Um, does does salvinorin hmm. have any affinity for the serotonin 2A? Because I know it's mainly it's mainly a kappa opioid agonist, right? Right. So so salv- salvinorin is this very very strange molecule in that it's it's not an alkaloid. First of all, so right. it's not constructed in the normal mm, alkaloid pathways, which is which start from amino acids. So, DMT, as we said, is an alkaloid that starts from tryptophan. Um, and there are many other types of alkaloids that start from other amino acids. But they all have that in common. They all contain a nitrogen somewhere, which comes from the amino acid. Um, but salvinorin is a completely different pathway. It comes from the terpene biosynthetic pathway, which is completely separate. So it's the only example of a psychedelic uh, that comes from this pathway. It's, it's completely unique, mm. uh, uh, and that it structurally, biosynthetically, you know, it, it's kind of chemical origin inside the plant is is completely different to the alkaloids, but also its mechanism of action. So, as we said, you know, the classic psychedelics they bind to this 5-HT2A receptor. The uh, salvinorins bind to this kappa opioid receptor. So, a completely different family of receptors mm-hmm. found in completely different areas of the brain. Um, and yet, here we have what is the most potent in terms of um, how much you actually need, you know, to to produce a psychedelic effect. So it's around two to five, six, seven, eight hundred micrograms, so less than a milligram, basically, you need for a full psychedelic effect of, of salvinorin. And it's reality shattering. It tears mm-hmm. your reality apart um, in a comparable but completely different way to something like DMT it replaces your normal waking world with an, another extremely bizarre mm. uh, world. So your brain, I, I describe in my new book, Reality Switch Technologies, I talk about this idea of this world space, that your brain is capable of constructing this, what appears to be this practically infinite array of different worlds, different molecules. When you perturb the brain with these different molecules, you're kind of accessing a different region of this world space, of the the potential worlds that your brain can construct. Um, Mm. uh, And so you you see your brain as this this tool, this world-building machine that you can learn to tune and to operate using these different molecules to access different um, different worlds, different subjective worlds, different realities that all have different structure, that all have different content, all have different types of entities within them. Um, so, so that's a whole, you know, we're not just talking about DMT now. Right. We, we, we kind of opened it up, um, seeing the brain as this, this, this tool, as this, this world building machine and these technologies, these molecular technologies that we can use to operate this machine. Um, yep. So, you know, there we've really just scratched the surface. Um, there's, there's so much we don't understand there uh, and so much to explore. Yeah, and salvia is such a crazy one too. I just got mm-hmm. permission to share this interview. I'm going to be posting it in the next couple of days of a, a salvia experience and it's not the only one of its kind either long story short because it's about a 20 minute video a guy who was a mormon living in alaska on christmas day he had never he he wasn't really into substances and stuff took a huge hit of salvia you know obviously one of those crazy potent extracts and uh all of a sudden like came to face down in the water and he he, when he like turned around he, he woke up to three people on a boat who claimed that they knew him and that he was like water skiing and that he had been face down in the water and he fell. And by the time they got to him, he was face down in the water by, by about three minutes or whatever. And then he realizes that these three people are claiming to be his friends that have known him his whole life. And that he just basically had a a near death experience from a water skiing accident, but he knew the whole time, well, I'm in Alaska. And in this experience, he's in a town called Tyler, Texas that he did not know existed. He says, and long story short, they took him to like urgent care and he's like telling them y'all aren't real. Like 
this is crazy. I just smoked salvia. They took him to urgent care. The doctor said he's okay. Bring him home, keep an eye on him, brings him to an apartment where he has this whole alternate like parallel reality. He said he looks slightly different. He was married in real life. He said he wasn't married and didn't have kids in this experience. And then he said like days went by and he was like, nothing is psychedelic. I'm just in this alternate mm -hmm. fucking world. And he's like, I got to go to work. And he's like, they tell me like, get dressed. You got to come to work or whatever. One of his friends who was on the boat, long story short, he's like, goes to work, is telling everyone at work he was some kind of supervisor. None of this is real. I'm on, I'm on a drug right now. Like da, da, da. And like people were starting to get concerned. People were telling him he had brain damage and all this. And well, this man claims that he lived a really regular life, including starting a band, everything. He said that as the days and weeks went on, he started accepting that he just had brain damage and that he had amnesia and didn't remember his prior life and that he somehow the accident caused him to formulate these memories of his wife and kids. But then he was like, it would trip me out because I would watch certain movies. I know I watched with my wife and kids in Alaska and this and that. And But he's like, ultimately, I finally began accepting it. And then he said one random day, eight years into living this parallel life, he said he suddenly felt the same physical sensation that he felt that landed him in that body and where he said like the molecules that made up his body didn't affect the molecules of the ground he was standing on. And he felt this crazy sensation of falling upwards. And he said, after all of this, accepting this was his life, everything for eight years, living every day, mundane, nothing, no psychedelia about it. He pops into his body in his brother's basement on Christmas, having just smoked salvia and he was seizing, he peed himself. And he and they he when he asked them like how long he had been there for, they said you were having a seizure for about 45 seconds. And he wow. experienced that as an entire eight years of living in a town that he later confirmed was a real place, Tyler, Texas, and all this stuff. Now, when asked if did you go? This was one of the most interesting parts to me it was when they were asked, well, like, did you drive at any point in this eight years? Did you go to the town where you were from, some, some town in Utah? And he said he drove there like a thousand miles and nothing was the same as how he remembered. it. He said the high school was called something different. It was like truly like just some kind of really strange story. And he said, uh, you know, he started... He said he started bawling, crying when he realized he was right the whole time, that whole eight years, everything. And he said his wife came in and was like, dude, you're ruining Christmas <laughs> as he was just like trying to shake back from this profound experience. And uh, yeah, the experiences like that are, and I mean, you can see in this dude's face, like he's not fabricating any of this. This was his mm -hmm. experience, you know? And it's just like experiences like that are so beyond unexplainable. And it's interesting how, how the body who, that, that, you know, he jumped into was like having a near death experience face down in the water when he assumed that position or whatever is there are so many questions that that opens up that even, I mean, DMT doesn't open up that particular, I haven't, I haven't heard of that one at all on DMT or ayahuasca well, or anything else. It's interesting. Actually, there was, there's a molecule called, now this is kind of terrifying, um, uh, salvanorin methoxyethyl, uh, what is it? Yeah, methoxy, methoxymethyl ether. It's, it's salvanorin, but it's been slightly chemically modified. Mm -hmm. um, so it has an extra bit attached to it. Um, and it sticks much more strongly to the, the kappa opioid receptor. So instead of lasting you know, a few minutes, it lasts for like three hours. Um, oh, and there's wow. very few report. Well, there's only one report that I could find on Erowid. Um, and I was reading, cause I'm writing an article this week actually about this molecule, uh, oh, wow. for my Substack, And, um, I was reading the only trip report and it describes basically what you've just described there. Somebody experiencing, uh, an alternate life, um, with right. a whole different life history. Um, um, completely independent, completely separate, not a memory, not, um, um, not a dream, but a, a completely different person living a completely different life with or without family and all that kind of stuff. Um, right. so, so I think with, with, with Salvinorin, you've got, um, a molecule that is 
it feels to me like it's more mischievous, more menacing. It likes to mm. fuck with you. Um, mm. uh, it's ruthless in that way. So I think that's when you when you smoke it or when you take <laughs> yeah. the concentrated version, when you chew the leaves or quid the leaves as it was intended for, it doesn't quite do mm-hmm. that. So that also says yeah, something yeah, yeah. in there. I'm sorry to me to cut you off. Though, continue. No, no, that that's true. Yes. Yeah. So it's when you isolate this molecule. So traditionally, it would have been, as you said, rolled into a cigar. Um, you know, between twelve and twenty-four pairs of leaves, or something like that. And you chew it, you nibble it slowly, and it's it's absorbed through the mouth, basically the buccal absorption. It's called, uh, mm-hmm. and it enters the brain very slowly and gently. And it's seen as actually a a more um, Uh, a gentler introduction to psychedelics, you know, in these Mm -hmm. indigenous tribes. You would start with salvia, then you would move on to mushrooms, right? (laughs) Whereas um, once you isolate the molecule, this pure salvinorin, um, it's a whole different beast. Then it is reality shattering. You know, this was not discovered until... So DMT, the psychedelic properties of DMT, were discovered back in 1956 by Stephen Zara, this Hungarian physician. He was the first person to synthesize it and take pure DMT himself when you know men were men, scientists were proper scientists. They didn't give it to animals or, or, or the volunteers. They, they injected it into themselves, you know, how it should be done, like Shulgin did. Um, mm-hmm. And Salvinorin um, was kind of a... It has sort of echoes of the of, of Albert Hoffman's. If you remember, obviously everyone's aware of you know his. He took what he thought would be a very small dose, you know, two hundred and fifty micrograms, quarter of a milligram. He thought that's the minimum. Obviously, that was a massive, um, a, a massive hit of, of LSD. Uh, and this guy called Daniel Siebert, who I think is something. He's a an ethnopharmacologist, ethnobotanist, but working very much independently. He was the first person to extract, take an extraction. You know, he'd worked with the leaf for a long time, but he was the first person to actually extract um, salvinorin, or what he didn't realize was almost like 90% pure salvinorin. And he, he smoked like uh, almost two milligrams of this um, in, his, in his house back in in the early 90s, I think it was. Um, and he experienced a complete, you know, this kind of thing that you're describing. And he was in, he would move between locations. One minute he was in his grandparents' house and then he was in a different life. And then he was in these bizarre, high, higher dimensional worlds. Um, um, and then he kind of finally, after you know, hugely, massively confused and disoriented, not knowing which was the real reality. Uh, that must be, I think, um, the most um, difficult part of it is not knowing. You know, you get these false awakenings. Right. Um, you know, where you wake up in a dream and then, whew, and then you wake up and you realize it's you're still in the dream and you wake up again. Yeah. You know, you can imagine doing that, but it, but it, but. You know, a thousandfold more intense and strange, not knowing whether you've mm. switched to another part of this this psychedelic reality or whether you've actually come back to what we assume is base reality. And it, it throws, right. you know, it, it it completely uproots all of your basic assumptions. That this is the real world. It's stable. We can rest assured. This is where we're coming back to. It, it, it tosses all of that out. Because it shows you that actually it's, it is possible for you to enter into other worlds that are as real, um, that seem perfectly normal, perfectly non-psychedelic. Um, mm. in that That's the kind of horrifying aspect, I think, of salvia, is it can do that to you. Yeah. It can really fuck with you in, in extremely profound. It's not a molecule to be messed with. When Daniel Siebert yeah. came down from his first Salvinorin trip, all he wrote was, this is total madness. It's tearing <laughs> apart the fabric of reality. Um, yeah. This is, this is a, an extremely s- serious piece of machinery, molecular machinery that he had discovered. Um, so he was, he was both delighted and exhilarated that he discovered this new tech, this new molecule, this new psychedelic, but also appalled about uh, its, its power.
uh, and 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 salvinorin seems to be it's much more terrifying in many ways than dmt uh, in that oh, yeah. it, it it does like to fuck with you it does like to mess with your conception of, of reality in, in in ways that that dmt doesn't dmt generally is it can be a little bit mischievous and there's a comic kind of ambiance often to dmt but salvia it's almost like it, it delights uh in 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 playing with your brain What's equally jarring about it too is like the the sheer caliber of time dilation is like unbelievable. Yeah. And the way that people's like sensory perception, everything's still intact in throughout the experience. And for the ones that aren't experiencing the psychedelia and are just living like a replacement alternate life, it's like the time dilation. I mean, like like I said, this guy's story is nowhere near the only story of that type. And so it's like yeah. really crazy. And it's interesting to me because you know, we're sitting here putting all kinds of focus on the serotonin 2A receptor as being like the main psychedelic receptor. Well, salvinorin being a kappa opioid agonist, and then you have other alkaloids like scopolamine, uh, which is an anticholinergic. So, mm. so it's like there are numerous receptor systems that can be targeted that allow, as you've been saying, to like for your brain to create this whole alternate world. I find that so mm. interesting. And it's like, okay, well, then what is the mechanism of how this is happening and like where do you know do you know if uh kappa opioid receptors are expressed more uh in, in higher numbers in a certain region of the brain yeah so so we know that the the, the clostrum which is a deep lay part of the brain it's, it sits beneath the cortex it's heavily connected so the cortex this outer layer of the brain as you know which this is responsible for constructing your world model uh, and then you have this the, the, the clostrum which is relatively small uh, but it's heavily connected to uh, all areas of the cortex. And it acts as best we know. I mean, the clostrum is still not fully understood, uh, but it, it seems to act as this um, global inhibitory control, like, an or uh, like a conductor for the cortex. It keeps it under control. I describe it as like the conductor of an orchestra. Your cortex that's building your world model is the orchestra, and the clostrum is the conductor. So it's keeping everything. It's you know telling which instruments to, to play and which to quiet and the tempo and the mood, oh, wow. you know, the, the whole dynamics of the concerto or whatever. That's your world experience being controlled by the conductor. And so what Salvi was doing is by binding to these kappa opioid receptors, which are heavily expressed in the clostrum, it's shutting that clostrum down. It's actually, these are inhibitory receptors. So we activate these mm. receptors, you shut them, you quieten the clostrum. Um, so it's like, uh, it, you know, telling a, con a conductor to, to instruct the orchestra to play a complex piece faster and faster, and then shooting the conductor in the head, right? So the whole orchestra just goes kind of wild it loses that that control and and um becomes much more dynamic and then starts to shift into entirely new patterns of sound uh, right so that's my current working model if you like of what salvia is doing it's, it's it's a release mechanism the classic psychedelics they directly activate these excitatory these excite excitating receptors the 5-HT2A receptor in the cortex whereas salvia it's like a release mechanism it's pulling away rapidly and efficiently this this conductor of, of cortical activity and basically um, uh, allows in, uh, entirely novel patterns to emerge um, which again obviously it's it's a big step to go from that to explaining how you can have eight years of an, an alternate life um, that's broadly what's going on. <laughs> I know. And to be clear for anybody who's listening, the kappa opioid receptor is not the same receptor that analgesics and pain medication targets. That's the mu opioid receptor. So this is an entirely Correct. different thing, even though it's called an opiate receptor. It's not, it's a, uh, you know, pain pills aren't, aren't going to send you into an alternate reality for eight years. But, um, yeah, yeah, it's just it's just so interesting, and then obviously another receptor system that really fascinates me, and and it's entirely different and yet equally profound effects is the NMDA glutamatergic receptor. And when you turn that one off, it seems to it yep. really reliably initialize out of body experiences. It seems to be it seems to me like glutamate, which is being blocked by NMDA antagonists like ketamine and methoxetamine. It seems to me that glutamate 
is because it's an excitatory neurotransmitter and it allows for like the electrical flow between neurons. It's like what it might be like what tethers consciousness to the body and prov- like makes it local to the body through electrical activity. Does that sound feasible to you and your knowledge? So, so again, I, I talk about, I talk about all of these different receptor mechanisms in, in reality switch technologies. There's the plug. Um, um, to kind of unify them together. So this is one thing. So ketamine, PCP, these NMDA antagonists. So what these NMDA receptors are doing, one of the things that they're doing is that they're controlling, first of all, they're con- controlling cortical activity. So NMDA receptors, they are also excitatory. They stimulate the brain when, they're, when they are activated by glutamate. And so by blocking these um, so this is where it gets a little bit complicated because these NMDA receptors, they're found heavily on these what are called inhibitory neurons, which help to keep the cortex under control. Uh, they balance out excitatory, excitatory activity. So when you block these NMDA receptors specifically on um, these inhibitory interneurons, you shut down the inhibitory interneurons. It's another kind of similar kind of release mechanism that you get with the cap- opioid agonist. It's, it's, it actually mm-hmm. increases um, neural activity, which, and, and the, the, the state looks kind of psychedelic. However, what it's also doing, it's also blocking or disconnecting um, because these NMDA receptors are also important in delivering information from the environment. Uh, and so you actually get this strange effect where your brain is your world model is being stimulated your 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 cortical activity independent of the environment is being stimulated whereas those connections that uh for uh, of sensory information into the brain are kind of shut down so the 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 world you experience starts to become divorced and separated from the environment so your brain is kind of given free reign if you like without having to be held account held to account by sensory information. So this is where you get this dissociative effect where you feel like you're, you're separate from the environment. Um, uh, and you can then, at higher doses, you can start to shift into entirely novel worlds. You know, if you kind of close mm-hmm. your eyes and take a good hit of, of, of ketamine, then you really are in a, another uh, reality that has been, uh, that, that you, that's kind of unmoored from uh, the environment in a way. Um, so different, completely different mechanism, but again, overlapping, but again, very different effects. All of these psychedelics, they're all unified in some way in that they're altering the structure and the dynamics of your world model and its relationship to the environment. Uh, but they all exploit different switches, switch mechanisms in the brain, whether it's 5-HT2A, NMDA receptor, kappa opioid receptor, these M1 uh, acetylcholine receptors, which is a whole whole different beast. Um, mm-hmm. you, you know, you're, you're, you're either stimulating or blocking these different switches, uh, and you get wide, a wide variety of effects, all different mechanisms, but all unified in that they are changing the, the this world model uh, that's being constructed by your brain and how it's speaking to, how it's receiving in- information from from the environment. And there might be more as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't know. I mean, nobody knew about this kappa opioid mechanism for inducing psychedelic effects until the 90s. Um, so it, it kind of raises the question, uh, are there other mechanisms that we've yet to discover that maybe have no relationship to any of these, nothing to do with serotonin, right. nothing to do with kappa, <laughs> you know, who knows? Right. And all this, all this goes back to to the notion that you were describing about the brain being the creator, right? The the, the creator of these of these worlds. And you know, obviously, in other episodes of, of the podcast, I've gone into the law of one framework. I had Jim McCarty on, and and we you know talk about these frameworks of consciousness itself. But what's important now during the this human incarnation and this experience where no matter the origin of consciousness that's kind of irrelevant to this conversation, while it's being filtered through this human vehicle, the brain certainly has profound control over our conscious experience, obviously. And mm-hmm. yeah, it's just super interesting that, uh, that, that these different receptor systems and stuff can cause such profound reality switches, as you, as you call them. And it's just, I will never 
I'll never get over that. It's it's something that is it's gonna interest me. And I'm just so glad to hear like that, you know, of of programs like DMTX and and like it's starting to get taken a little bit more seriously now because in the mainstream scientific framework, the hard problem of consciousness is still a thing. Like people really still can't fully dis- agree on how to define consciousness in and of itself. And science has always looked at things that can be easily experimented on objectively. We can get objective data on this. Da, da, da. So now we're finally moving to where like mainstream academia is at least taking huge steps to try to study phenomenon of the psyche and of consciousness and altered states of consciousness. I think that, you know, we're living in a really special time to 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 be to bear witness to that and also the advent of artificial intelligence and and machine learning all at the same time. It's just like it's so crazy the times that we're living in, dude. I'm so stoked to be here dude, for all this and be able to watch and hopefully volunteer for DMTX. Don't forget about me. <laughs> No, I agree. Uh, you know, consciousness is is a great mystery. It's 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 kind of why I, you know, consciousness is self evident. There's no doubt. It's the only thing. The only thing we really can't deny is our own consciousness. Mm-hmm. I mean, that goes back to Descartes. Um, so so I, I I don't talk too much about what is consciousness or where does it come from? Is it a product of the brain? Is it being received by the brain? Is it something else? Um, I, I, what I focus on is, is the structure. You know, we know that we're conscious. We know we exist in a subjective world. Uh, we know it has it's rich, uh, it has information, rich information content. It has structure, it has geometry, it has dynamics. Uh, and clearly altering the this world model constructing machinery of the brain alters that that uh, that subjective world model and so that's what i focus on is um, i think you can get bogged down into trying to uh, also provide an explanation for what consciousness is uh, i think that's um, that's a whole different question it's probably it's almost certainly related no, totally. of course. Yeah, but totally. I think you need, you're setting yourself up to fail if you think, oh, I need to explain consciousness at the same time. So I often get uh, accused of being materialist or reductionist. And it's like, no, 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 no. All I'm doing is taking one aspect, the the obvious aspect uh, of, of this, which is that you can manipulate the, the structure, the information content, the structure and dynamics of the world model, and that is obviously related to changes in neural activity. So I just focus on that, but I'm still as uh, uh, still as awed by the fact that we are conscious at all. That's always in the mm-hmm. background there, but I'm not in a position to explain necessarily what that consciousness is or why right. we're conscious. I think there's a lot of you know, there's well, a lot yeah, of science. Was- hmm. That was that was my that was my point. Is they, I mean, obviously, you know this. They call it the hard problem of consciousness. I don't think anybody mm-hmm. can describe that, dis- despite that it's self evident. Have you? Uh, are you mm-hmm. familiar with the book Biocentrism by Robert Lanza or the theory? In general? Uh, yes, I read that um, a long time. Did ago. you enjoy it? That's quite a, did did um, you enjoy it? Yes. I mean, I, 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 what I tend to do is I, I tend to as much as possible maintain some distance between. These, I mean, there are everyone. I used to say, you know, everyone's got their own theory of everything now. It's like it's mm. it's kind of a it's kind of a trendy thing, you know, to have your own. I have an explanation for everything, um, and I, I I never latch on to these things specifically. I read them with great interest. Uh, I think there's a lot of good ideas people have, but as soon as you attach yourself to a worldview and say, "Ah, oh, this is the explanation." This is the explanation for consciousness, for human life, or whatever. Um, then you can become stuck. Uh, I, I try to remain very open. I go with the the data. I I try and keep my foot firmly planted in well established neuroscientific territory. So I don't completely. Right. I don't want to alienate. Um, to use the word, uh, I don't want to completely alienate. Um, the scientific community. I, don't, I think that's a bad move because then yeah, once you say, okay, I'm, I'm now a, uh, a biocentrist or I'm now a, uh, you know, some other metaphysical philosophy, then you're in a different realm. Then you're, you're amongst the mystics and, um, the other kind of um, occult and, um, astral plane and all this stuff. You know, I don't have a, I'm not dismissing that. 
but there's enough people with that approach and you know anything yeah. goes once you once you allow yourself to be take, taken in or taken taken off by uh, these metaphysical philosophies and things then you can say anything you know I, I could say now oh the dmt world it's the astral plane done you know it's kind of <laughs> yeah. you know wh- okay fine or, or it's the this plant spirits or you know it's the spirit world or anything like that i can or it's the collective unconscious even that's an, an one that people have tried to you know to package everything neatly in there once you do that it's like, okay, where do I go from here? What what have I actually explained here other than giving it a name? And I don't think, in my opinion, you've explained much. So I right. always try to avoid as much as possible or keep a reasonable distance from these other um, less neuroscientifically grounded explanations. My strength right. is that I'm able to... I'm able to, you know, I have the background in in chemistry and pharmacology and the neuroscience. I'm able to draw from that as much as possible without completely losing my moorings and and drifting off into um, spirit worlds and the Kabbalah and you know and then that kind of thing because it's it's just not my it's not my field either. I'm not an expert in it. Mm. Uh, I think we all have to bring our own particular expertise and and worldview and perspective on things. And, and mine is the the neuroscience perspective and i think it's a reasonably unique perspective that i have on these things so i'll continue doing that <laughs> yeah yeah no doubt and i mean i think what you're saying is highly important too as far as not accepting any one particular especially when it comes to theories of everything not accepting mm-hmm. any one particular thing is absolute fact i don't think that the truth can be encapsulated into one theory or a set of theorems or whatever but rather like i approach these kinds of books and 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 frameworks from like a a syncretic point of view where it's like I really value syncretism I think that's my strong suit is being able to entertain things without accepting them as truth but also find the nuggets and the parallels between different frameworks and then it starts feeling more and more like some like like more of a possibility or more of a probability and you know my takeaway from biocentrism was the simplest possible takeaway is that Consciousness is one of the fundamental forces of the universe and cannot be separated and is not a something that emerges biologically within the universe, but rather that it is a, a fundamental principle or of part of the fabric of the universe itself, just like the um, the fundamental forces and whatnot. And so that that just having been explored in the way that Robert was exploring it from that kind of half ac- academic perspective was it felt like a big step for me because it felt uh it felt like a big step for society from my perspective because it felt like like one of the first steps that i had personally seen i'm sure there were many before of um this kind of like integration of as you said like kind of a what was priorly probably only known as dogmatic perspectives or even religious perspectives um or spiritual perspectives with that of like quantum mechanics and, and and the study of consciousness itself and, and physics and just kind of at least trying to integrate um, all of those things. But I mean, as you said, you, you can't kind of lean super hard into, into one thing. It's mostly a trap, uh, I would imagine pretty much every time. But I really have a passion for like drawing parallels between things. And so I really love the law of one material as bizarre as the origin of that material may be. It's been just, I mean, I've drawn so many parallels to so many other traditions from it. And even, I mean, like you were saying, people saying the same thing in different ways. Much of what the Kabbalah talks about, the Law of One talks about, much of what the Law of One talks about, Chris Langan's uh, cognitive theoretic model of the universe, CTMU, describes what the Law of One talks about as intelligent infinity, or which is what a quantum uh, physicist would describe as a wave function. And the CTMU from Chris Langan, uh, Basically, it says all the same things, but through the perspective of computational language theory. So it's, it's kind of like a, a self-generating executable program that uh, has the ability to like read, write and into itself. And all the principles are the same. But for me, personally, I feel like my understanding deepens when I hear the same kind of concept. And sometimes you got to dig to even realize it's the same concept. But when I hear it articulated and... Um, like using different metaphors and different comparisons and analogies and whatnot. I feel like that kind of deepens my understanding a lot more. I'm really passionate about reading those kinds of books. 
Yeah, for sure. I think um, you know we're all pulling together the pieces, and you find pieces mm-hmm. in places that you didn't expect to find them. Uh, and so we're, we're we're kind of walking around in a in a dark room, uh, and and and. and picking up objects and trying to work out what they are and how they're related and trying to get a picture of what this room looks looks like um and then realizing that this room is actually a part of this whole universe um that we didn't know existed you know we we we, yeah. we really we we we're, we're fumbling around in in a dark room in 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 one in one house within a multiverse you know it, it's that it feels like uh, we're we're really only getting a very very small part of the picture, and it's it's very difficult. We have to accept with humility that it's extremely difficult for us to. We certainly can't claim that we've got a handle on what reality is, what consciousness is, what our relationship is to other aspects of reality at all. We have to be very very humble and accept that we really don't know that much and there might be limitations too of what we can know um you know as terence mckenna used to say you know where is it writ large that this monkey you know that came down from the trees should be able to formulate valid models of of reality uh, we kind of assume mm-hmm. that that we can uh, and we we are in many ways extremely successful you know the, the cognitive sophistication of the human brain is 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 quite remarkable no doubt about it but the, to assume that that represents the pinnacle of cognitive sophistication and the, assume that it's the pinnacle of, 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 of what's possible in terms of intelligence and technological right. advancement is is a huge anthropocentric assumption uh, and we have to be careful and we have to be humble and aware that uh, as dmt demonstrates you know when you enter the dmt space you are confronted with intelligences that are seem to be much older uh, and much much more advanced in intelligence um, mm. than, than than we are um, and accept that, and that's very humbling for us. We we we're used to thinking of ourselves as being the top of the tree, um, totally. and you know, within species on Earth, in many ways we are, in many ways not. Um, but we're we're used to having that that superior, elevated position. So it's quite difficult, I think, to accept that actually we might be much uh, lower down in that intelligence hierarchy than we previously mm-hmm. hoped we might be yeah regarding regarding not being able to figure it out one of my favorite alan watts quotes is um as we develop more and more powerful microscopic instruments the universe has to get smaller and smaller in order to escape the investigation <laughs> i really love that and i really think that i think that's such a testament of quantum mechanics and just the bizarre nature and how everything just keeps getting smaller and smaller. And just once you kind of get down to it, as Robert Aaron Wilson said, you know, we see solids, but science only finds webs of dancing energy. And I think it's, I think it's, it's really important to, to recognize and then figure out like how to appreciate the fact that where we're at, at our evolution or whether it's by design, uh, our limitations are what create this sphere of reality and are what set the parameters for the human experience as we know it, you know, like all of the things that we do, all of the art that we create, all of the, 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 the journey itself of like asking the question, like, what the fuck are we? And like, what are we doing here Mm -hmm. is the human experience. And like, I've, I've just come and DMT has helped me drastically with that as has ayahuasca as has psilocybin. I've just really come to appreciate the great mystery in that sense. And like, even though I have this insatiable, like hunger for knowledge there's also like the other half of me that's just like whatever like i'm here i'm embedded in this game i'm gonna live it you know yeah i think alan watts also said uh, that um it's like the finger cannot touch itself um the teeth cannot bite themselves so we 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 sometimes forget that it's that our analysis or investigation attempting to get at the universe uh, and understand its structure is also a process of understanding ourselves that we are fundamentally mm-hmm. part of that structure so there's always this limit uh, we can't look inside our own head so to speak in a, in a sense um and we're, we're never 
we 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 tend to um, dislocate ourselves as being observers of reality, observers mm-hmm. of the universe that can have this objective. You can take measurements and stuff uh, mm-hmm. and, and work out what's going on. Whereas we forget that we're also part of this larger structure. We are part of the universe. We're lo- trying to, like the finger trying to touch itself. Mm-hmm. We can never quite get there. Reality always recedes. You know, the closer mm-hmm. we get, as you were saying about quantum mechanics, the deeper and deeper we go, uh, the more reality recedes, the more it plays with you, the more strange mm-hmm. and uncertain it becomes. Um, so, yeah, I think, uh, you know, a lot of shifts in perspective uh, are required um, to get a true handle on, on what reality is and what it means and what's our relationship to everything and um, all of this stuff where we're just emerging now. We're just kind of reaching that stage in the last hundred years or so. Well, we, we have these these technologies now with you know, the DMT technology, as I see it, is this, this recent technology uh, that we're just beginning to work out how to use. And I think DMTX is part of that. We've discovered this tool scattered throughout the natural world, this technology that's been there since time immemorial, um, but waiting for an intelligence with the right level of technological sophistication to actually isolate it and identify it as this world switching technology and then to learn how to to use it as a technology and develop it and that's where we are now we discovered Mm. it you know less than 100 years ago you know certainly the western world you know the pure model i mean it's been being used for tens of thousands of years, granted, in a different fashion by various yeah, cultures. Exactly, but yeah, yeah, in this in this mode, in this fashion, for sure, it is. Mm-hmm. It, it hasn't even been the blink of an eye in the grand scheme of time since since it was first discovered, isolated. Since Nick Sand found out you can smoke it after everyone was IMing it for the longest time, and then yep. yeah, I mean, we've made already leaps and bounds of progress in, in in the academic world with it as well, thanks to Maps and Johns Hopkins and Boston University and all these amazing places. Thanks to work that you've done and the books that you've written, and you know, I'm sure I'm sure your books have have drawn people to the field as, as well. You know, as did Rick Strassman's books, and just you know, the the passion for understanding that there that. There again, this is not a drug. This is a fucking biotechnology, unlike anything else that's ever been experienced. Is like it's really appreciated because you know I think I think people like like you and Dr. Strassman and Rick Doblin and the people at Maps and and uh, uh, Roland Griffiths at Johns Hopkins are just like really catalyzing a major shift in consciousness in the Western world that's like so fucking needed at this part of our timeline as a global society. You know, and uh, yeah, it's just really. It's going to be really interesting to to see how all of this unfolds over the coming decades. Again, as I said, like parallel to the advent and integration of artificial intelligence and machine learning into society, it's just like the potentials is. I, when I start thinking about it, my brain just wants to pop. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, man, Andrew, this has been a an amazing amazing conversation, dude. I really I really appreciated this this whole whole talk. This uh. It's starting to feel pretty complete to me. I want to give you the chance to, to um, you know, direct people to whatever you have going on, tell them where to find your books and, and all that jazz before we before we call it a day. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, so my uh, I have a heavy presence on Twitter. So if you're on Twitter, Alien Insect is my handle. You can find me there. I have a Substack called Alien Insect on Drugs, where I write weekly about the neuroscience and the pharmacology of all different manner of psychoactives including of course psychedelics Uh, my website is alieninsect.net there you can find links to everything um, including interviews and things like that that i've done and lectures and papers i've written and of course my book so alien information theory as you mentioned my first book 2019 uh, and then recently um, released in October last year, Reality Switch Technologies, which is, I think, the most comprehensive and detailed guide to how psychedelic molecules work in the brain, how they change the structure and dynamics of your world from the level of molecules interacting with receptors through to the behavior of neurons all the way up to changes in, in, in your 
your your world in the, your perception of reality. So if you're interested in really learning uh, deeply about how psychedelics work in the brain, then please go and buy Reality Switch technologies either from my website or from Amazon or any other uh, bookstore that you choose. Um, yeah, I think that covers it. Amazing. Well, like I said, this has been a fucking awesome conversation. Thank you so much. I hope to do a part two one time because we still barely scraped the surface. <laughs> it's been, what, like two hours? So, yeah. man, there's just so much to discuss in this arena and so much exciting things. But, yeah, man, thank you for your work, brother. I really appreciate it. Everybody really appreciates it, even if they don't know it yet. And uh, yeah, I appreciate you. We'll chat soon. Thank you very much. Ayo, and I'm, 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 I'm